Proverbs 23, verse um, verse seven. We'll go there in just a moment. Um, as you're going over there, the doctor, there was a doctor who looked at his patient and said, you're in terrible shape, man. You got to do something about it. First, you got to tell your wife to cook more, more nutritious meals. Then you got to let her know that you got to stop working so hard. No housework for you anymore. No chores, no responsibilities at home. You got to tell your wife all this. Also inform your wife that you're going to make a budget and she has to stick to it. You're not going to be able to help with the kids for several weeks. You need to relax and ask your wife to nurture you and meet all your needs. She's going to have to make love to you anytime you want. And unless there are some changes like that, unless these changes take place in your life, you'll be dead in 30 days. Doctor, the man said, this would sound way more official coming from you. Could you please call my wife and give her those instructions? Well, of course, I'll be happy to. So when the man got home, his wife rushed to him. I talked to your doctor, she cried. You poor thing here. Let me help you sit down, sit down right here. He told you everything the man said to his wife. Yes, she sniffled. I'm so sorry to see you go in 30 days. <laughs> How many know we cannot rely on somebody else to help us get better? How many know we got to take matters into our own hands if we want our lives to get better. How many know that you can't blame somebody else anymore for why your life is the way that it is and you can't expect somebody else to do what they need to do to make your life better. And we've been talking about our authority for the last several weeks, eight to ten weeks or so. We've been teaching about our authority in Christ that Jesus said, behold, I give you authority in Luke 10, 19. He said, behold, I give you authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means injure you, hurt you or harm you. So God has given us authority over the enemy. So why are so many Christians defeated if God has given us authority? Well, I believe that the, 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 the failure in life comes from within, just like victory in life comes from within. And we've got to wake up to what we have authority over. Now, we already have authority over the devil. We already have authority over uh, the, the powers of darkness. We have authority over, the Bible says, every creeping thing. We have authority over our bodies. We decide what we're going to put into our bodies. We decide how we're going to care for our bodies. Nobody is to blame for your physical condition. You can only blame, you know, uh, you can you can only blame a pregnancy for so long. You know, the lady that said, man, it's just baby fat. And we know we know it's baby fat. But look, the baby is 21 years old now. You can't keep blaming it on that. But we have to take control over our bodies. We have to take control over our health. We have to take control over our lives. And one of the things, the most important thing that I believe that exists in the world today that we have to take authority over is our thought life. Amen. If we don't take authority over our thoughts, then we will fail in life because our thoughts control the rest of our lives. Proverbs 23 verse 7 says it very simply as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. One translation says, as a man thinks within, so is he. Or as he thinks, so is he. In other words, our lives are going to become a byproduct of our thoughts. Our thoughts produce our feelings, our decisions, and our decisions produce our actions. Our actions create habits, our habits create our character and our character produces our destiny. But it all starts with our thoughts. We don't have to worry about our destiny if we focus on taking our thoughts captive. We don't have to we don't have to be afraid that our dreams aren't going to come true. We don't have to be afraid that our destiny isn't going to come to pass if we take control of our thought life, because the thoughts are what lead ultimately to our destiny. So if we can change our thinking, it will change our decision making. It will change, which will change our actions, which will change in our 
in our habits, which will change our character, which will ultimately lead to our destiny. So thoughts lead to decisions, decisions lead to actions, actions lead to habits, habits lead to character, and character is what produces your destiny. That your destiny is going to be a byproduct of continual behavior or continual way of responding to life that will eventually lead you into your destiny. If you just behave a certain way once in a while, it will never produce the results that you want. But our focus doesn't need to be on our behavior. Our behavior is the fruit of what we're thinking. So if we will get control of our thought life, if we will learn to conquer our thought life, if we will learn to produce, if we will learn to think great thoughts, then we will experience a great life. Great thinking produces great living. And so the more that we can identify what are the mentalities that are corrupting our destiny, what are the mindsets, what are the thoughts that are destroying our future, what are the thoughts that are affecting our health, what are the thoughts that are affecting our, our marriages, our families, what are the thoughts that are affecting our decisions, what are the thoughts that are affecting our future, it's all, it all boils down to identifying the thought patterns, the mindsets that are keeping us from our destiny and eliminating those mindsets. And if I could just explain a little bit uh, to you about this, your thought life is what will determine the quality of life that you live. And we see this in Proverbs 23, 7. And, and, and let me just make a few statements for you and then we'll break some of the verses down as well. But every great or terrible thing, every great or every terrible thing which has happened in the world began as a single solitary thought. Everything that has ever been accomplished in this world, every great thing started as a thought. Every terrible thing started as a thought. So we can determine the outcome of what kind of world we're going to live around us, what kind of family we're going to have around us, what kind of job and career and what kind of quality our lives are going to take on based on the thoughts that we think. Every single person's life, every one of our lives, the life we're living right now is the byproduct of the thoughts that we're thinking. If you're constantly, if you're feeling down all the time, if you're feeling discouraged all the time, if you're feeling low and like defeated all the time, it's because your mind is filled with negative thoughts. And if you will begin to attack those negative thoughts with God's way of thinking, then what will happen is that way of thinking will eventually create the life that you've always dreamed and the life that you've always wanted. Thinking produces living. Right thinking produces right living. High thinking produces high living. Low thinking produces low living. It's just that simple. It really boils down to that. Now, God has given us a new spirit. When you got born again, you were given a brand new spirit. In your spirit, you are born again. The part of you that got born again was not your face. Don't you wish that part of you got born again when you got born again. No, I'm just kidding. You look beautiful. But the, the part of you that got born again was not your body. It wasn't your physical presence. It was your spirit. Your spirit got instantly born again. But we're made up of three parts, spirit, soul and body. So our spirit is born again. Our body is going to be conformed to the Jesus is going to give us a brand new body at the at the time that he returns, at the time of the rapture or the second coming of Jesus or whichever one of the buses that you make. I'm going with the first load. How about you? I, I, you know, I want to be ready for the first load when Jesus comes back. But the point is, is that we're going to be given a new body, but we can we can work on our body. We can we can control our body, the Bible says. But what happens to the soul is what actually determines what happens to our physical health, our financial life, our family. In fact, if you go over to third John verse two, let me show you this verse. Look here in third John verse two and Paul, uh, John the apostle says this beloved third John verse two beloved. 
I wish above all things. Now notice what he says here in 3 John verse 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that you would be in health. And, and the Bible says that you would prosper and be in health. Uh, put up 3 John verse 2, please. There it is. Beloved, I pray in all things that you would prosper and be in health just as. Notice that word, just as. Just as you'd hoped, just as you wished, just as God intended. What does it say? Just as what? Just as your soul prospers. So what he's saying is, is that our lives will take on a prosperity and a health based on and in direct proportion to the prosperity of our soul. Amen. So soul, I like to say it this way, soul prosperity produces whole prosperity. In other words, if you take care of your soul, it will penetrate and impact every other area of your life. And too many Christians, they're trying to fix their lives. I'm going to fix my husband. I'm going to fix my wife. I'm going to fix my marriage. I'm going to fix my kids. I'm going to fix my, my health. I'm going to fix this. We're trying to fix all these things on the outside when if we would just learn how to prosper our soul, then all those other areas would be a byproduct or the overflow of a healthy soul. So we have to give attention to our soul, which is our mind, our thought life, which, which also results in our emotions. And something about emotions that so many, so few Christians understand is that our emotions are not, you're not, your emotions are not the byproduct of your ethnic background. Your emotions are not the byproduct of the kind of mother that you had. Your emotions are not the byproduct of the nationality that you possess. In other words, how many of us have blamed our emotional behavior on our culture? Well, I'm Italian. <laughs> he said, oh boy, because he's married to one. Um, <laughs> so am I. But my, I got the double, I, I, I got double for my trouble because she's Italian and Irish. So you put that, you know, hot Italian and hot Irish together and you got some hot Irish Italian. And um, so we blame, oh, I'm Irish. Oh, I'm Italian. I can say, oh, I'm Middle Eastern. You know, then you're really scared, right? <laughs> I'm Middle Eastern. You know, we don't, you know, we don't get even. We blow up things. That's our, that's the bumper sticker on the back of my cousin's car. So this is the thing we got to realize is we got to stop blaming it on our nationality. And, you know, I'm a woman. I'm more emotional. I'm a guy. I don't, I'm not emotional. Everybody is emotional. Everybody's emotions are the response of their thought life. It's not a result or a reaction to your blood. It's the reaction to what you're thinking. So if you're thinking that person's really against me, that person really hates me, look at the way that person looked at me, and you start thinking those thoughts about how a person is behaving towards you, you begin to get angry at them. That anger didn't come because you were Middle Eastern or Italian or Irish. That anger came because your thoughts were filled with negativity towards that person. Our thought life is what produces the emotions that we feel and the emotions that we have. And I know I'm not going to have time to get into this in, in the detail that I would like, but I want you to understand a few key principles about this and you'll really grow from it as a result. Listen, if you don't control your mind, who does? If you're not going to control your thought life, who will? People say, well, I just can't control all the thoughts that go through my head. Well, then who is? Who is in control of the thoughts? You see, we have to realize our eyes are a gateway. Our ears are gateways. Our ears and our eyes are gateways into our thoughts. And whatever we're looking at, whatever we're listening to, is going to begin to shape our thought life and shape what we believe, which will ultimately shape what we do 
and ultimately lead to our destiny. Now, I want, like you, I want a great destiny. I want my life to take on a great future. I want my life to be magnificent. I want the greatest. I want what God said. I know the plans that I have for you, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and to give you a hope, right? Jeremiah 29, 11. But he says, one translation in, in t- Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the thoughts that I have towards you. One translation says, I know the plans that I have for you. And I ask the Lord, why, Lord, why does one translation say, I know the thoughts that I have for you? And one translation says, I, I know the plans that I have for you. And God said, it's the same because my thoughts will produce my plans. Yeah. If you can get impregnated with my thoughts, you will give birth to my plans for your life. That's what God showed me. That's how he put it for me. If you get if you can get impregnated with his thoughts, you will give birth to his plans for your life. And too many people are they're they're living lives that with without plan with without God's plan, they're not experiencing God's plan, God's purpose. Why? Because they're not thinking God's thoughts. God's thoughts always produce God's plan. God's thinking always produces God's, God's destiny and God's purpose for your life. You can't think God's thoughts and not end up in God's plan. Amen. You cannot think God's thoughts and end up broke. You will not end up broke. You may start out broke, but you will not end up broke. If you're thinking God's thoughts as a man thinks, so is he. Therefore, if I'm thinking God's thoughts, it's going to it's going to show up in my in my finances It's going to show up in my marriage It's going to show up in my health. It's going to show up in my relationships because I'm filling my mind with God's thoughts. And as a man thinks within, so is he. He becomes the byproduct of his thought life. Are you still hearing this? Listen. You should adopt this mentality in life. If you can, if I can, man, just get some this across you. This is what this is what changed my life. This is what turned me into a winner rather than a loser. This is what delivered me from depression. This is what delivered me from anxiety and fear. This is what delivered me from all the worries that I that my mind used to be filled with and my heart used to be weighed down by is that I got a hold of this, that this works for anybody. There's no magic to this, that if you will take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. In other words, does this thought line up with God's word? Does this thought line up with what Jesus Christ did for me? Does this thought line up with the finished work of the cross? Does this thought line up with grace? Does this thought line up with love? Does this thought line up with promises from God? If it does not line up, then it is being sent out. And the Bible says that Uh, The Bible doesn't say anywhere how we're supposed to take demons captive. It says we're supposed to take our thoughts captive. In fact, it says we're supposed to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You should regard life as a search and destroy mission. Listen to what I'm about to say. You should treat life as a search and destroy mission in which your main target is the limitations that you find in your mind. Your target that you should go after, your search and destroy mission is to find the limiting thoughts that are in your head and destroy those thoughts, those small thinking thoughts, those God is a small God thoughts that I have a limited future thoughts, all of those things. I can't amount to much. I don't know that God could really use me. I wonder if I can get healed. I wonder if God will do it. I wonder if my prayer will get answered. I can't overcome this addiction. My marriage will never work. I'll never recover. These limited thoughts are what we need to go on a search and destroy mission against and begin to take control of who's trying to drive our car into a ditch or steal our boat into an ice into a into an iceberg we we've got to be willing to take our life back and take the steering wheel back and take control back by taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ that's how we win in spiritual warfare look this is spiritual warfare the devil is already defeated 
The devil is really not your problem. The Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. He will flee. You, you understand, that word flee is not some, you know, he's going to sort of back off a little bit and hide behind a vase somewhere. No, it means he's going to run in terror because you submitted to God and you resisted the devil and Satan began to flee. Listen to me. Satan is not our problem. He's already defeated. Jesus defeated him on the cross. He came to seek. The, Jesus, the Bible says that the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. So he destroyed the power of the devil, but Jesus did not come to destroy your thought life. Jesus did not come to take your thought life captive. He gave you the power to do it. Amen. He gave you the power to do it. How I think about you is how I'm going to eventually behave towards you. How I think about myself is eventually how I'm going to treat myself. If I think, oh man, I'm not going to, I don't have much of a future and I really, I don't know, I don't, I feel low about myself. I feel low self-worth, low self-esteem, a low sense of uh, value, a low sense of purpose for my life. Then that's how I'm going to start treating my body. My body is going to become, my body is going to become a vessel for that kind of thought life to carry. And so if my body, th if my thought life is saying to my body, well, it, you're not much and you won't amount to much, then my body is, gonna, is going to conform to whatever I'm feeding it in my thought life. And that's how we, that's how we win, folks. This is how we rule our lives. Better is a man, Proverbs 16 says, better is a man who rules himself his thought life, his spirit, his inner man. Better is someone who rules his inner person than one who captures a city. Proverbs 16, 32 tells us that. Bet we're, we're better if we're ruling our inner person than if we were to capture an entire city. Take control of your thought life and it's like it's better than capturing an entire city. That's how powerful. Can you imagine if you could single-handedly take control of the city of Chicago? That would be pretty powerful. You'd be pretty powerful. If you could single-handedly take control of this city, of our entire city, and eight or nine million people population in the city and stuff. Think about that. Would you, you, you'd, be, you'd be pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah. You took control of this city. You're running this city. You're in control of it. You say something and it happens. You want to tear down a building and it's gone. You want to put up a building and it's up. You want to take out an airport and it's gone. <laughs> there have been people that have had that kind of power in this city. That would be pretty awesome. That would be pretty powerful. That would be pretty amazing. It would be pretty significant. But yet, God says, you're even more powerful than that if you will take your thoughts captive, if you'll take control of your inner self. Search and destroy, man. Go over with me quickly to Psalm 18. Watch what I'm going to show you here. Psalm 18. Look at look at this. This scripture is going to blow your mind. Psalm 18. And he says this, look, search and destroy. Verse 37, Psalm 18, verse 37. He says, I have pursued my enemies and overtaken them. Now, David is talking about his physical enemies, but our application in the New Testament is our spiritual enemies, which is our thought life. Our thoughts are our enemies or our friends. We we have to take our thoughts captive. He said, I pursued my enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn back again until they were destroyed. This is the attitude you've got to have towards wrong thinking. This is the attitude that you've got to have towards limited thinking. This is the attitude you've got to have towards mentalities of acceptance and tolerating. And when I mean accepting mediocrity, tolerating the way things are in your life, tolerating sickness, tolerating disease, tolerating a life of, without purpose, tolerating poverty and lack and, and tolerating misery and depression and anxiety and fear and tolerating all the things that are going on inside of you, it's time that you do not turn back until they are utterly destroyed. Look at verse 38 
Verse 38 goes on to say, I have wounded them so that they could not rise. This has got to be our attitude towards our thought life. They have fallen under my feet. Verse 39. He said, for you are You have armed me with strength. What has God given us? He's given us the armor of God. He's given us the breastplate of righteousness and the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith. You have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose up against me. Look at verse 40. He continues. He says, you've also given me the necks of my enemies so that I destroyed those who hated me. You know, the thoughts that you allow in your head, they hate you. The thoughts that say you're a failure, you'll you'll never make it. Those those thoughts hate you, and we must destroy those thoughts. Verse 41, they cried out. That's what thoughts do. They're constantly crying out. You're not going to make it. You're not going to get there. You're not going to overcome this. You can't break this. You can't have a great life. You can't have a great family. You can't have obedient, godly kids. You can't have health. You can't have blessing. They're crying out. And it says, David said, they cried out, but there was none to save. They even cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. Verse 42, look at, God didn't answer them, so here's what I did about it, David said. I beat them as fine as the dust before the wind, and I cast them out like dirt in the streets. Are you starting to get a mentality of how we need to be towards our thought life? I'm just trying to arm you with something here. I'm not, you know, if you want a Super Bowl Sunday, this is going to make it super because you cannot, look, we cannot approach life as, you know, kind of mealy mouth and flimsy flamsy with our thought life. We must attack the thoughts that are contrary to God's word. We've got to obliterate them. We've got to pulverize them. We've got to smash them as fine as dust. They're crying out to control us, but we've got to take control over them. And I taught you how to do that last week, and I'll teach you again. I'll say it again. We'll do our little experiment we did last week. Let's do it again real quick. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to show you how to conquer any wrong thought. No matter, and I'm going to show you how to conquer any thought that comes into your head. I'm going to ask you to, to, to do this. In your head, I'm going to ask you to count to 10 silently in your head. And then I want you to listen to my next instruction whenever I give it to you. Are you ready? Yes. Ready? In your head, count to 10 silently. Ready? Go. Now say your name out loud. What happened? What happened when you said your name? You stopped counting. Why? Because your words have more power than your thoughts. And so what you have to do is you retrain your thinking with the word of God coming out of your mouth. God takes when we when we use our words, as we've been talking about for the last several weeks, God takes those words and the Bible says in Job 22, verse 28, he says, Job 22, verse 28, he says, I, he, God says, you shall decree a thing and it will be done for you. It will be established for you. You decree it and it will be established for you. God will take your words and bring them to pass when you use your words to conquer your thought life. It says, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5, we're pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations, and taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We're taking every thought. How many thoughts captive? Verse 5 says, taking every thought captive, bringing every thought into captivity. Let me close with this, with this concept. The word captivity comes from a Greek word which is broken down into two words and it means this, to conquer with a sword. The word captive captive or captivity there, it means to conquer with a sword. So when he says to bring every thought into captivity, he's saying we conquer every thought or we take every thought captive by conquering it with a sword. Well, the the Bible says the word of God is the sword of the spirit. So when we speak God's word, we are conquering or we are taking every thought captive. We're conquering that thought with the sword of God's word. So when the thought comes to you and says, oh, you're going to be sick this 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 month because it's sickness month, it's flu season. You need to conquer that thought with a sword. 
the sword of the Spirit and say, by his stripes I'm healed. No weapon formed against me is going to prosper. No, no, no disease, no virus, no ZZ or Zuzu or whatever, whatever thing is flying around. It's not coming near your dwelling place. In Jesus' name. Amen. 